John Macias, he asked me, he's the curator for the mission, he said, what do you think? I said, do you want me to tell him? And he says, hurry up before God strikes us dead. And I said, well, you know, Catholics didn't have a saint for murderers and rapists, and now they do. <laughs> you know? Spanish came to San Diego in 1542, and then the missions began in the Los Angeles area in about 1771. And from then on, life as we knew it changed completely. Everything went to hell. That's when gods were thrown in the trash and women and men were, were killed and our language and our baskets were burnt and everything that human beings can do to each other was done. With the Spanish forcing their ways on us, if you practice any of your culture, you were either going to be beaten or murdered. And in that fear of wanting to survive, to make sure that your children can be here still and their children will be here still because we're definitely the kind of people that think about generations to come, it made them choose the religion, it made them choose the language, it made them choose a name from the Bible just to stay alive. The landscape changed drastically. It wasn't just the human beings that were affected. That balance that I talked about was completely thrown off. Several elements were knocked out of balance. And so that just sent everything spinning. They destroyed the land because they brought all these cows and bulls. They needed so much land to eat and grain that it kind of just tore up our land as far as natural forms. Water and food was only seen as, uh, as something to ingest or imbibe. The spiritual got knocked out of everything. It's funny, somebody asked my dad, how is that important to you? And he looked at him, I never had anybody ask me that. You have to have water to live. <laughs> so it's kind of an obvious question. But you think about that, how your whole life is surrounded by that water, everything you do depends on that water. So it's very much a cultural resource. We live around how to preserve and take care of that water. You could see that back a long time ago before outsiders came to this valley. The space as far as the water and the way that we used water and took care of water, it actually was disrupted prior to Los Angeles arriving in the valley. It was changed when the settlers started arriving. When settlers came in, you know, they really did see that this place is open and really ready and ripe for them to come in and just take it over and own it. The, the way to get rid of native people always is to destroy their food supplies. And that's what they started doing. And when the cattle came in and the settlers and everything, you know, they started moving the water and putting up fences and their cattle trampling and eating our livelihood. Our people got desperate and were looking for resources and that's when the ranchers were coming in with their cattle. And so a family was out and the man was out looking for food and he came across the cattle that had separated from the rest of the herds and he shot it because it was by itself and he just thought oh it's lost so I might as well take this to feed my family. At that time the ranchers came up looking for that cattle and they found him starting to butcher it and immediately they shot him because it was their property. And so that caused a big stir and it started a lot of small skirmishes throughout the valley because people were starting to fight and get revenge. We battled and we battled and our people aren't a warring people and we just wanted peace. I mean, if we were gonna be able to thrive in this place, it was gonna be through peace. And the military basically just said, you're our prisoners. That's where a lot of the massacres came from. We had massacres. There were several around the Owens Lake. There were several up on the river just for no reason at all, just come in and kill people. When Spanish rule came to California at the time, we were taken from everything that we held sacred. And that means the water. That means we didn't have the free right to just go down to the river and pray or collect the water as we did or irrigate it into our needs. It was 
usually meant for labor. We had to go down to the water and now use the water to help the mission system, the forced labor, and that also required water. So the relationship changed. When we talk about Tungwa labor, it's forced labor because we lived in harmony, right? With the earth, with everything around us. A lot of the things that you see in Los Angeles that look more from the Spanish time, that was our doing. We were slaves to these people and being a slave means you do as you're told and that requires building. They want to say that it was the, the missionaries, the padres, uh, the conquistadors, and then the rancho era. So we just get thrown under the bus when it comes to acknowledgement of our sacrifice. Because without us, without Tongva, without our land, none of this would even exist. But then the Mexican came and kicked out the Spanish. And when that happened, we then were under their ruling. And still, if it was for us to survive, we had to do as they said. Everything that came in those two eras were definitely Tongva involved in the building of their city and their home. America would take over these lands, our ancestral home. What the United States of America was doing is they were contracting treaties with the native people so that they could say, you can govern this piece of land and we'll govern this piece of land. It wasn't a choice for us ever, but it's either you sign this paper or you die. So there was different villages that would congregate into what is called Fort Tejon today. And at that point, they, they took us and they removed us. And if it was in the heat of July, the hottest month of the year, children, elders were all marched across the landscape and down into uh, an area just south of, of Bakersfield. It would be the head of the BIA at that time who decided he wanted the land for himself. So the paperwork, our, our treaties, they disappeared. Poof, they were gone. He could take that land, just like that, because that's how things were back then. It would be 50 years later that our treaty would reappear and nothing would come from that. Representatives of the city of Los Angeles entered the city in arguably very shysty ways. They very much came in hidden um, disguised as local new families that were moving, you know, and buying up land as though they were going to come and live here. Only later on did the local people find out that they were um, under the guise of a much bigger plan and agenda. By 1895, Mulholland, Eaton, and Lippincott come here, but they wanted water for LA because LA outgrew the LA River. Once they hit the population of 250,000 people, they knew that they needed more water for L.A. to get bigger. And that's where they got the idea of building L.A. Aqueduct. In 1904, William Mulholland and Fred Eaton began purchasing land in the Owens Valley. In 1905, there was a bond that the city of Los Angeles approved to construct the aqueduct. So it all happened rather quickly. The construction began in 1908 and it was completed in 1913 I believe and then during that same time period in 1912 President Taft set aside over 67,000 acres for possible reservation for the Indians. The lands that were set aside for us were higher up on the fan and really were key places for moving water which is why they really wanted those lands for Los Angeles to be able to control. And LA in the 30s did a, a series of reports to document the conditions of the people that were living here. 
the title of it says it all. We were the Indian problem. Those censuses are very derogatory and belittled us and made it look like we're just poor, pitiful people. The federal government didn't agree with LA's summation that we should move to a totally different area. And so LA, knowing that we weren't going to be moved out of the Owens Valley, began working with the federal government to see how they could exchange these lands that they really wanted for other lands. In 1937, L.A. had gone before the, the federal government to be able to work on things, and so Congress passed an act so that they were able to and willing to trade land and water with the city of Los Angeles on behalf of, of the natives living here. L.A. said, well, we can do land, but we can't do water. And so the federal government went back to itself to say, how can we do this? And they said, well, okay, we can do this and the, the water issue will be settled at a later point in time. Well, <laughs> that later point in time still hasn't happened yet. What that means is the Big Pine Reservation sits on 279 acres of land. Underneath that land is groundwater held by Los Angeles. Our people called this place Payahunadu, place where water flows. When settlers came in, it was still a place where water flowed. Then it, it changed entirely when LA came on because then it became the place where water flowed south. Where we sit as, as ones that struggle with the future because how can you really plan for the future when you have question marks about what you actually have to be able to move forward into the future.